This is kind of our Happy New Year service because this is the last service we have in 2019. Some of you are thinking, thank you, Lord. Hey, Dave. Uh, that was good. It lasted two days. <laughs> that uh, stuff you brought, too, the, for the bra. Yeah, it's pretty good. I appreciate those kind of food gifts, you know. It's just... And it saves me a lot of work. And my family thinks that I slaved over it and enjoyed that, huh, Jake? It's good. Anyway, um, so are you guys still feeling Christmassy a little bit? Because sometimes we're kind of rushed through the Christmas stuff. And of course, we always, you know, get, you know, the birth in, but there's other things in the story that sometimes get overlooked and I'd like to like mention a few of those things and kind of kind of bounce onto maybe a couple of things that that Grace House brought up like a couple of weeks ago. What was that question? Uh, what was Jesus doing all that time between his birth and when he went into ministry? Well I have I have some stuff here. You if you guys are interested in hearing it. You just got to know what you're looking for, you know, when, you, uh, uh, when you're searching the scripture for certain things. And hopefully, you know, I could, last week I forgot John the Baptist's dad's name, Zacharias. Uh, but none of you remembered it either, I mean, come on. <laughs> and I, I was going to say, well, I'm going to blame it on this head cold that I had for five weeks. Or is it six? I don't know. Anyway... Uh, uh, sometimes it just happens, but I, I'm going to start putting names down now. I, I don't do notes. Uh, sometimes I'll write a little thing if I want to remember to say something, uh, but I, do, I put scripture on here, and you guys get to see those. So, But listen, to me, Christmas is something that the believer should be having continually, because we're celebrating Jesus all the time, and Christ, Christmas is actually Christ Mass, or the anointing, or, and the anointed one, and his celebration. And we celebrate that continually, because if you really understand what God did for the human race through Jesus, is he rescued it. And how many artists do we have in here, or builders, or... You create things, and you might write songs, for all I know. I see your hand, Nancy. And you get into a project. Nick, is that you? What are you doing in California, buddy? Are you back? Okay, good to see you. Totally distracted me, man. Good to have you here. Anyway, uh, and you get into this thing that you're doing, whatever you're doing, and, and you're like, man, I got the wrong foundation on that or I didn't start that right and you scrap it you just toss it tear it up throw it in the trash maybe light it take a match and light it on fire I don't know but anyway aren't you glad that God didn't do that with us and it got pretty pitiful at times but God had a plan that he was going to send his own son into the earth so that we might once again be brought back into the family and into his bloodline and it was pretty successful the thing is is man still has free choice woman still has a will and boy does she <laughs> so it no no I'm gonna leave that there <laughs> if I'm gonna preach at anybody it's gonna be you guys <laughs> Don't you know that life could be a whole lot better if you just treated her well? Keep the romance? All right. Okay, that, we're done with that. <laughs> but anyway, God made it possible through his son that... And he took the struggle out of trying to be good if we just surrender our life to him and let his spirit live in us because that's when he begins to produce his life within us and it's not a struggle where you're trying to keep a 
bunch of laws or anything else, but it's a grace. It is the actual mercy and grace of God that picks you up and undergirds you, and it holds you in that place that you need to be. And, but as we visit the, the birth and, and the days following of Jesus, it's, it's just incredible the things that were spoken because all of a sudden the fullness of, of time had come upon the world. That's why the end of the world came in that day and the old covenant was be, being done away with, not destroyed, but its time of completion had come. And we were getting a brand new covenant, a brand new start that was actually sealed by the one who would bring the covenant. He wasn't just the testator of the covenant, but he was going to... See, a covenant can't go into force until that person dies. Think about that. But then he rose from the dead to make sure... That his plan is carried out to its fullest. Isn't that amazing? But when you, when you begin to look at the whole thing and how important it was that when, when God's Son came into the earth and here it was, the fullness of time was upon us and he was born of woman but yet he was all God. He was God-man. Something that had never been done before and... The plan being that God needed himself to redeem the human race because he knew that if he sent his word, his word would accomplish it. Because you see, when God sends his word, it always accomplishes everything he sends it to do in all of creation. When he speaks his word, it would happen and he would see it and he would see that it was good. And so he sent his word to redeem the human race from the curse. Because, the, see, the word never returns to him empty or void, but always completes the task at hand. That's what Jesus did. But when he was a little baby, seemingly, you know, he was a helpless little, this little thing, and... He needed someone to nurture him and love him. And so after eight days, uh, according to their customs and by the law of Moses, they take him and have him circumcised and then go to the temple to have him. We practice this and we call it baby dedication. Giving what God has given us back to the Lord for his service, but then we are the keepers and the razors of that child. You understand this. And so I, I'll, I'll remember this fellow's name. He was a priest and they, they brought baby Jesus in. Just a few days old. And uh, g give him to Simeon. Now Simeon was very special because he was a man of God that was led by the Spirit. He walked in the Spirit. He heard from God. And God had made him a promise. I think I'll just read it to you, all right? We just read this part of the Christmas story. It's Luke 2.25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It's really important, you know. If you're going to do anything for God, you need Holy Spirit on you. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Do you know how many people was waiting for this event? Well, there's a good few that are still waiting for it. What amazes me is there are a bunch of Christians that are still waiting for it. But anyway, he came. Was that too much for you? This man knows he is not going to die until he sees the Messiah, until he sees the Lord Christ. And so he came, into the, he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, 
Simeon, or he took him up in his arms, that was Simeon, and he blessed God and said, it's funny what he says here, because he recognizes right away who this child is. Being in the spirit and having the eyes of faith, he looks upon the child and he takes him and he lifts him up and he begins to say this blessing to the Lord and he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation man that, I don't know about y'all and some of you ponder this a lot what it would have been like to be here when Jesus was here physically on planet earth or what would it have been like you know to walk here when he did I thank God that I didn't that I get to live today and in this time, there was many that rejected him in that day, even his own people. But this prophet, this priest, lays his eyes upon him. My eyes have seen your salvation, a light for revelation, and the glory of thy people. Israel. See, they need a song about this. <laughs> you see, which you have prepared before the face of all people to bring a revelation. That's an apocalypse, okay? Just so you all know. To the Gentiles and to the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul. Do you think that she felt the entirety of that sword pierce through her soul? I think so, for everything that she experienced from his birth. And you know, there's times in the scripture where it said in Mary or Jesus' mother didn't say nothing. She just pondered the things which she was beholding, which she was hearing. And, but she was also at the foot of that cross, along with John and a few others and the other Marys. But it's also talking about the sword that would pierce through all of our souls. And this sword that is a discerner of thought and knows the intents of the heart, which is what this is talking about. And the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Remember Jesus, the man, he would walk into a crowd and he would know what they were thinking. Or they would say something and he knew what their intention was to entrap him. And what would he do? You can't entrap wisdom. They didn't even realize who they was talking to. They didn't know that the one that they were waiting for was in their midst. You know, right before his crucifixion and he comes into town and all the children run out with the palms and he's riding on the little donkey and they're crying out, Hosanna, 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 and the religious people are indignant, and they're trying to hush people up. What did Jesus say? They got to cry out, because if they don't, the very rocks will cry out. Think about that. Why were they indignant? Let me, let me, let me, can, can I get a stab at this? Can't you see that we're in here praying for the coming of the Messiah, and you're out here making all this racket? Show a little respect around here. <laughs> Is that pretty good? <laughs> I have crazy thoughts, but anyway. <laughs> but the hearts are revealed because of who this person is. But here he is as a little child, little baby. And they're going through everything that they're supposed to according to the customs and the law of Moses. And 
so that when they had performed all these things according to the law, they returned to Galilee in their own city, Nazareth. Now listen to this. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So that's what we're told about his life, that he just begins to grow, and he is growing in wisdom, and he has favor with God and with man, and we don't hear anything else about him until, what is it, how old is he? No, no, no. When he was just a child. Huh? Ed, sing it out. How old is he? You said, huh? Twelve. Twelve years old. So, and it's funny that these things always happen because, you know, he's the Passover. You guys know that, right? And so they're down there at Jerusalem at the Passover and celebration. And, you know, there was a large party that traveled down to Jerusalem and so so when they had done all that they had come to do they began to journey home and you would think that Jesus would have been pretty important to them you know he's the eldest of their family too you know but anyway uh, the 12 years old is pretty young and they get way down the road before they realize he's not there and so they're looking around for Jesus and they got to go back. And so they're looking for him. And three days later, where do they find him? In the temple. Yeah, in the temple. And he's sitting amongst two. A bunch of teachers. And he is listening to them. And he's telling them things. I think I got a couple of those verses here. He's 12 years old, and they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And so I already told you this story, so I'll jump into this. And so now it was after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. But that's not all he was doing, because he was, they would, they would speak, but then he would say something. So it says, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding <laughs> And his answers. Yeah. So when his parents see all this going on, they were pretty amazed too. It says that they saw him and they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, what have you done? Why have you done this to us? Isn't it like a parent making it all about themselves? <laughs> Do you think a 12-year-old Jesus is going to be put off by that? I got another little story after this one. <laughs> she includes Joseph in this. Your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he says to them, why do you seek me? Did not you know that I must be about my father's business? You guys are asking me about that song. Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? You got to excuse my voice. In my father's house, doing his work. <laughs> See, Jesus, even at 12 years old, knew. So he's growing in this wisdom and favor of God and favor with man. And so he's developed. What is he doing? Well, the, 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 the prophets and the psalmist told us all about what he was going to be doing. He was going to rise early in the morning. He was going to meditate on God's Word day and night. He was going to find himself in Scripture. Can you imagine reading Scripture and then, all, and then reading about yourself? But he used the Word of God. I mean, just understanding this and knowing that he knew who he was. See... As you begin to read these prophetic scriptures, and think about Jesus going through the scripture and reading those about himself. I mean, there was a young king, and this is a whole other sermon, but I want to throw this out there, who 400 years later 
after it had been written and chronicled in the scripture, he tells them to go, and he's 12 years, he happened to be 12 years old, this young king, tells them to go into the temple and clean it and restore it, bring out the, the books, and he finds that his name is in there. This little youngster, this nobody king, all of a sudden becomes raging and tears down all the idols and burns the false altars and restores worship to God in his house. A young king because he found himself in the scripture. Think about that. Did you know you're in the scripture? You're all through it. The most important is John 17, just so you know, Ed. All right? Y'all with me? Well, I better throw this in. Uh, Luke 2, 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Listen to this. I'm not going to hold you late, but I want this to resonate in your spirits tonight. Because Jesus, remember how favorably he spoke of the psalm? Huh? He, I think it was some of Jesus' favorite scripture. Because remember that, that David, the man who represented the earthly king, that he would be called the son of David. I mean, which is incredible, which went over most people's head. They didn't even understand that. But he will rule and reign on that throne forever and ever. You see, our king will never depart from the throne. He is an eternal king. Before I read these, I, I want you to consider something. I jotted this down. I've seen this somewhere before, but I, here's something to think about. Men are born babies to someday become a king and rule a nation. But in the case of Jesus, he was a king who was born a baby to become the savior of the world and who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, what he stepped down from his rule to be born a human baby for you and I. It's pretty incredible. So as he's growing in stature and understanding and wisdom, he's opening the scriptures. This was him. Psalm 119, 97 says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. I have more than the ancients. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I knew I could get that right. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep your word. I have no departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. <laughs> Do you think you can depend on him? Do you think you can trust him? Do you think he will treat you like other humans and just desert you and leave you out hanging in the middle of nowhere? Or will he be there? What does he promise? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Not even to the end. Psalm 40 and 7. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll or the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God. And your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourselves know. What did Jesus himself say in John 17, 25? O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me Oh, this is that same portion of Scripture, Ed, that I was on. There's more to it. But. I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. You see that whole thing about Jesus, and I was talking about that we are in the Scripture is right here in this, where he's talking, and then he's praying. This is actually... If you, you know, we have the Lord's Prayer, which is incredible. It's amazing because he's instruction prayer. But his actual prayer 
includes all. Because as he's praying this, and he prays this, Father, that I be made, I mean, they be made one with me, even as I am one with you. And I do not pray for these alone. See, he's with his disciples saying things to them that are most important because the crucifixion is imminent. It's just, just a, a few days away. And so he's speaking to them heart to heart. He even said, there's things I want to tell you, but you're not ready to receive them. He says that we all be made one, and I don't pray for these alone. In other words, this is a private group meeting with his disciples. But he goes, I pray for all of those who will believe in me because of their words. We come to know all of this stuff because they wrote the Gospels. They wrote letters. They shared the testimonies. They touched God in the flesh. They witnessed all of this stuff in the flesh. And then shared their testimonies that we, not, we might have an account of all the things that happened. And it was that pivotal point on planet Earth at his, his birth that our very calendar is based upon. He changed the entire world and continues to do so. And quit weeping, oh, we're in, we're in tumultuous times. We're, things are going haywire. The Christians are suffering. There's more Christians on planet Earth right now than there ever have been. Our God reigns. Jesus is Lord. And there's nothing can stop it. And we need to be bold and tenacious in, with our King because everything that He does for us, He deserves our very, very best to Him. Don't you agree? So bring your best. I don't care if it's beating the drum. And do it with all your might and do the best you can. Because Jesus is worthy of our honor. He's worthy of our praise. He'll never let you down. And what a year. Huh? 2020, here we come with full sight. Amen. God bless you all. Happy New Year. Mm -hmm.